Today's episode is brought to you by Media for All, which was set up to help encourage more black, Asian and other ethnic talent into media and to provide a support and mentoring network to ensure talent flourishes in the media industry that we all love. If you're looking for a mentor or would like to mentor young ethnic talent, check them out at mediaforall.org.uk and it is all 100% free. Hello and welcome to the shiny new object podcast. My name is Tom Ollerton. I'm the founder of Automated Creative, and this is a podcast about the future of marketing. Every week or so, I have the pleasure and the privilege of interviewing one of our industry's leaders, and this week is absolutely no different. I'm on a call with Emmanuel Govert, who is global brand lead Toblerone at Mondelez International. Emmanuel, for those of the audience who don't know who you are and what you do, can you give them an overview? Sure. So, hi, Tom. First of all, thank you for, for having me. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm Emmanuel. I'm born and raised in, in Stockholm, Sweden. haven't lived in Scandinavia for about 12 years. I am originally a failed football player. Kind of missed the train, the bus, and that flight to a professional career, maybe to the UK. Uh, today, I describe it as my kind of character building years, because typically my pattern was I went in, uh, got injured, and then I came back a little bit too early, and then I got injured again. I mean, the good thing then was I had the opportunity to study a bit uh, instead, which was good uh, to sort of uh, discover that actually probably a football career wouldn't really thirst my curiosity in the the same way as as doing some other things. So after uh, that failed football career, I joined a telecommunications startup and this is early 2000s. So you can imagine plenty of kind of private equity cash flying into anything.com. Uh, we uh, had, a, had a great time. It allowed me to, you know, achieve great things with a great group of people. Among other things, we launched MTV Mobile in Stockholm, which was exciting at the time. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's, uh, you know, we never really made any, any money. So, of course, the kind of uh, reality caught up. But, you know, I see there's a very important transition from, you know, let's call it a failed football career into more of a, okay, actually, probably in, in business and in other ways, you can, you can do great things uh, if you decide to. So that's there. And I realize I have lots of distractions here from my computer, but uh, hopefully that's not going to ping too much in the, in the recording. Uh, and then, actually, I became a, a youth activist. So started studying but traveled the world telling companies and organizations that um, and politicians frankly that whether we like it or not um, you know the world is in um, in a complete sort of disaster mode so we gotta we gotta do something and you know uh, pretty much came to terms with that whether we like it or not companies kind of runs the world so i could either be this frustrated person standing out of the gates telling companies to to change or i can see the efficiency and the track record of businesses to achieve their goals as a as a real kind of opportunity to join a business and over time you know build confidence uh, credibility and a bit of skills not to be underestimated to try and over time with patience find a way to make a, a change from the inside so you know after many years as a youth activist i got to this point of frustration and instead of continuing to bang my head i, I joined a business and at the time it was basically cadbury and since then i've done lots of different roles within sort of Cadbury and, uh, you know, Kraft Foods at the time, and then eventually Mondelez. And now I'm leading this incredible brand called Toblerone that everybody knows, but uh, actually, if you ask them the last time they ate one, it was a a little little while ago. So, but yeah, so that's what I'm doing today. I'm leading Toblerone uh, globally based in Switzerland and uh, yeah, living on a farm here in Switzerland. (laughs) Fantastic. So, Many different jobs, many different angles, many different ambitions. How do you want people to remember your career? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. I think now, 10 years in, and probably have been wearing this Fire Me t-shirt for, for some time, right? I think in the end, uh, and specifically accelerated becoming a, a dad four or five years ago, four years ago, and then second time a year and a half ago, I think increasingly... I, I don't want to be remembered for that, you know, incredible marketing campaign that I did or, you know, an amazing film or any of that types of content stimulating consumption, but really someone that wanted to take on the industry 
and uh, help the industry moving towards a kind of force for good type space, using business really as a way to, you know, with the resources we have at our disposal, with our incredible sort of, and I'm, I'm in consumer goods, and that's one of the appeal why I joined a, a big company, because the, the, the potential to touch, you know, if not millions, billions of people daily, I think uh, helping and using the resources of business to do the hard work on the, on the sort of back office to make it easier for consumers in the end to have a, a really good experience that's good for them, but also obviously, you know, in a way good for the world, which means that, you know, we're going to tackle, you know, all of the challenges leading up to in the end what consumers will, will have in their back pocket. So in a word, what a, how I'd like to be remembered is probably as a, or in a, in a sentence, is someone that you know became a, a force for good in the industry, uh, and it sounds preachy and cliche maybe, but really not settling with just selling more stuff, which is kind of the conventional measure of success for any marketeer, but really someone that you know, yeah, of course we're going to drive our commercial objectives in any business, and that's part of being sustainable for how the, the current system works but also someone that, um, you know, put in a little bit more effort to also make that, um, you know, a, a good thing for the world. And then we can talk more about what that means um, if we go there. So, yeah, a force for good, Tom. I think that's how I'd like to be remembered. So that's a big ambition, but you've still got to do the day job. You've still got to sell stuff, I guess. And so you've got that weight that, expectation on yourself of being remembered for that and making a measurable and significant change above and beyond moving product so but you still have to do the job so how do you deal with the overwhelm you've got a young family so you've got one very big goal and you've got very short-term goals with for the brand and you know you've got to manage um probably homeschooling as well so how how do you deal with work and life when it gets too much yeah it's a good Good question. I mean, I I have this little sentence in my head, which always when I get overwhelmed, I think, let's think about the little things that helps me do the big things. So, you know, as always when, yeah, and I mean, you should see me, you should have seen me five years ago. Now I'm exponentially aged uh, as a father in this. So of course, it's, it's probably easier said than done, but I'm a, I'm a big believer that big things only comes from doing the small things really well. So when it when it comes to being overwhelmed, in the daily basis, I'm trying to have my, what I call resilience practices to help me put my best foot forward. So it could be as simple as, you know, starting the morning by getting the body up and running. So that could be, you know, a little bit of core exercise for the stomach and then some burpees. And then of course, leaning into a hectic, getting kids out of the door in the morning, even at COVID, because our kids are young, they still go to childcare. So that's our, our blessing. Uh, but then making sure that on a daily basis, trying to spend quite a lot of time outdoor as part of that resilience practice. And, you know, the minute that feeling of overwhelming coming, my response maybe 10 years ago was to work harder, push more. But now it's probably trying to take a couple of deep breaths to create this space between, okay, now there's an overwhelming feeling coming. I can respond directly from that stimulus or I can try and create this gap where I I breathe, I might be going for a walk, I might be going for a run, and then come back to it with a slightly fresher sort of mind. And in, in a way, that's also how I think about my kind of bigger goals, that I'm trying to not focus on, on the big goal on a daily basis, but really focusing on doing the small things that I do every day uh, really quite well. So I don't know if that makes sense, uh, but it's sort of a, a driving belief of mine that you've got to master the the little things the habits that you know builds up you to be the best that you can be every day and then trust that if those habits are the right habits uh, then that will help me you know have enough energy to go and chase the big things of course you know there, there are so, good days and bad days on on these things it's not like yeah, yeah i was gonna say like you're the first human. the first yeah. guest the first guest who says they do burpees every morning so i uh i highly amused by that vision uh, i can highly I wonder, recommend wonder... <laughs> it actually um and so does that happen every day every day yeah wow even weekends 
even weekends. Amazing, amazing. I'm gonna and say every day. How many? Just, just start curi- curiosity. Because I'm approaching, I'm approaching 40s. I'm doing, I'm doing 40 burpees, right? I'm 37. Oh, but wow. uh, okay. my goal is that um, I should do as many burpees as my age, which means it's only going to get harder and harder. So I, I better be a little bit ahead now. Uh, right. kind of planning, planning you're making planning. me feel very bad about myself so i, I recommend so, uh, yeah anyways you get you you get the blood so flowing like, in the entire body yeah uh, yeah I, I, yeah i'm sure but how do you know what the right resilience practices are to test so just from my, my personal perspective i sort of got quite into like you know having that perfect w- w- morning routine but actually it didn't work you know um, was meditation and journaling and gratitude and stuff but it didn't like it didn't last no not it didn't definitely lasted but it didn't really change anything and, and in fact for a a practice that was supposed to be uh help me self-examine um actually i missed some very very major things so i'm um, how do you decide what is a resilience practice how long do you test it for and how do you know if it's working i mean it's a it's a constant uh, test and learning knowing that there are some components in there that really works for me so i, I got to get the, the the physical components going and i ideally like to get the the mind going as well so before kids i had a, a whole regime which always started getting outdoor getting kind of the, the blood flowing then making sure i had enough time to read something do something that sort of got my uh, mind stimulated. And then, of course, the, the breathing exercise, which doesn't have any quick sort of <laughs> effects, really. It's something that if you do it for a consistent, at least this is my experience, right? If, if, if you do it, and I've probably been on it now for yeah, better part of 10 years, that you know, it's, it's not what it does to you in the moment, but it's when you then take it away at some point, you start realizing the difference. Your mind is a little bit more spread in your focus um you you feel a bit less kind of yeah in in the moment to go and tackle these little things and do them really really well so you know i i I don't think there's like a silver bullet set of practices that works for everybody but for me it's getting almost thinking about almost like a bit of an engine you got to get the physical going you got to get your mind going you got to get your spirit sort of centered around the right things and then versions of these practices really helps and of course we don't have two hours, certainly not with kids, right? So that's why I went from, you know, the, the 45 minutes, go for a run and do, you know, 20 minutes meditation to quick burpees, uh, doing some breathing exercises. And then, you know, that, that is sort of the morning practice that I know it. And then trying to, you know, make sure I drink a lot of water as well, because hydration is something I, I feel works um, re- really well. Just, you know, instead of shoveling in lots of, I shouldn't say this, I work for a snacking company, of course, it's great uh, ways to have a bit of chocolate in there, but really just trying to exchange a lot of the, the food intake to water instead, just making the, the body consistently through the day feel quite healthy as well. So it's a, it's a continuous experimentation and testing and learning and the things that doesn't work, I, I drop, you know, after a period of time, but then, yeah, within the stuff that works, if I miss a day, and, and again, you, you asked me about the birthdays, is it every day? Yes, it's every day, right? But then if you look at 100 days, maybe I would have missed two of those days. Missing two of those days doesn't make a difference for how I feel fundamentally. If I would sort of get off track and miss, you know, three or four days in a week, I would, I would make a different, uh, I would feel the difference instantaneously. And that's why I think the reward for me is, is really the, the continuous part of of doing the practice because it's that that means that you have enough sort of resilient surplus to to kind of get off track momentarily when 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 life throws you that way uh, so i don't so, know if i answered your question but it was just yeah just how i look at it so before we move on to your shiny new object can you share with us your favorite marketing tip that bit of advice that you always come back to and find yourself sharing with others most often for me, and it's actually a relatively new one, but it's such an obvious thing that, and I'm in a consumer goods kind of company, and we're quite obsessed about consumer centricity, and, and we tend to pay, pay people to have a point of view on what they might do in the future, right? That's kind of, we do consumer research to figure out what people do. And I think the biggest reframe that I'm trying to get to and have been getting to in the last couple of years is to, to get into behavioral learning. So instead of you know, uh, as, as I said, you, 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 
you pay people, you know, you reward them to, to say what they might do in the future is only at best uh, indicative of what, how they might behave. So I'm really now in the space. So we got to get them to behave. We're going to get real people to behave with your products. So, you know, let's make a little, uh, try and sell a little because it's nothing like voting with your dollars uh, and see how that sort of really translates, the intent translates into real behavior. And then in that process, make sure that we, we can learn a lot in terms of how we iterate around it. Uh, very simple, I think. Tech companies have, have always been having an alpha, beta, and everything in the middle kind of approach to the way to do learning. But it's quite difficult when you work with food because it needs to be food safe and all of these different sort of um, compliance measures around it. But really try and obsess about before you go and make too much that you don't really know if, if real people want and if it fulfills a, a proper kind of unmet need. Let's, let's uh, try and make some stuff uh, even if it's not 100% polished and get it into a behavioral environment that for me is, has, has really just step changed the way I, I look at consumer centricity because real behavior, there's no proxy for it, really. Yeah. Was that a too long answer? Uh, yeah, I'm just curious to know how you would wrap that up in a sentence. Uh, make a little in the context of your product. So whatever it is, make a little try and sell some of it. I, is there demand? Does it fulfill an unmet need? And then in that kind of process, learn what, what you need to change to better fulfill the need that you're trying to serve with your product. Uh, so I can, I mean, I can elaborate uh, from an own experience on how we did this in, um, you know, with, with, in my last role, but uh, yeah. Yeah. That'd be fantastic. Yes. Please. Make a little, sell a little, learn a lot. So in the case of my, my last role, which was part of Snack Futures, which is sort of the invest and venture arm of, of Mondelez, so a little bit split outside of the mothership of this um, of the company, we started looking at cacao fruit, and, and obviously we are one of the largest uh, buyers of, of cocoa in the world, being one of the largest chocolate companies in the world. We might even be the largest chocolate company in the world. And you know, realizing that in that process of making chocolate we obviously take it from the cacao fruit we extract the beans but in extracting the beans it leaves sort of you know at the scale of 10 million or tens of millions of tons uh, and don't quote the number uh, because that will trip me up but millions of tons of wasted cacao fruit that at best becomes pig food i it serves some kind of purpose but at worst it left it's left on the farm to rotten so in in kind of looking at cacao fruit, we decided let's let's take this thing, let's create a, from novel food, which is then it's not regulatory approved food. We made it into food, and then we upcycle that wonderfully delicious and nutritious kind of fruit in cocoa fruit into a product. And you know the, the normal way of doing it was we would have done a lot of consumer research and then ultimately try and scale launch it somewhere. But we realized probably that's going to have a slower adaption curve. Adaption curve. So we upcycle it, we, we created with some chefs, amazing kind of product creations that we started selling in 15 stores in Los Angeles uh, back in 2019. And then through selling the customer feedback we got, the consumer feedback we got from actually selling some of these products, and it was in the thousands of units, a very small scale in a way, uh, then allowed us to pretty quickly, both executionally, recipe wise, um, and, and also route to market wise, got some really good learnings that we then iterated and essentially relaunched into a larger number of stores. So a very counter kind of conventional innovation process uh, on that particular thing. And of course, that was testing out an entirely new business model, upcycling food, uh, going through the regulatory approval of making it food was, was a big deal. But then making a few thousand units, selling them, and then iterating and, and essentially relaunching at a slightly larger scale. Uh, when I talk about how I, you know, how that particularly relates to my, I guess, legacy that I want to have in the industry is, yes, it was upcycled food. We found a wind powered way to manufacture the product. We put it in a recyclable packaging, but we didn't settle with recyclability. We also wanted to reward people to actually recycle and, and close the loop fully. So trying to create a, a fully circular snack that for, for, for the consumer, it's a delicious, nutritious 
product that they want to eat in their lives, pop it in through smoothie or eat directly. But from a kind of blueprint for how I think businesses needs to start evolving in, in the future relating to my shiny new, new object, it's, it's really doing that heavy lifting of really creating something that's so sustainable, but also good nutritionally for people that then, um, you know, almost becomes a new business blueprint for how we can create circular business models um, more, more broadly. Easier to do in kind of a test and learn sort of phase than to do it at scale. But it's, I think it's the challenge we need to take upon ourselves in, in, this, in this world to, to get there also at larger scale. This episode of the Shiny New Object podcast is brought to you in partnership with Manfest. Whether it's live in London or streamed online to the global marketing community, you can always expect a distinctive and daring blend of fast-paced content, startup innovation pitches, and unconventional entertainment from Madfest events. You'll find me causing trouble on stage, recording live versions of this podcast, and sharing a beer with the nicest and most influential people in marketing. Check it out at www.madfestlondon.com. So let's move on officially to your shiny new object. And um, we, you, you've t- touched on it uh, a, a number of times, but it's it's using business as a force for good. So can you help us understand really simply what that is and how you're going about it and how others can use business as a force? Yeah, for and I don't want to kind of claim the fame for the for the actual slogan, if it's any fame at all. But obviously there is this movement around the world called benefit corporations, where as part of the business model of the company, you need to commit to holistically across, you know, lots of different dimensions, sustainability, human rights, et cetera, but do business serving a greater good than just return to share owners. So in a way, you know, that sort of philosophy, I think can be applied in its puristic form through benefit corporations and B Corps, where it becomes sort of a legal requirement. But I think even at the smaller scales is a guiding mindset that I think we should pursue working for, for brands in any, any kind of uh, form. So specifically, you know, what it means to me is that it's not, you know, taking on the CSR because Corporate social responsibility implies that you can do a hell of a lot of bad as long as you do a little bit of good. And what I think using business as a force is good is that you bake in doing good into your product and into your business model end to end. You know, and if you can't do that end to end in the beginning, I think where you know I'm trying to do it is it's really depending on the you know what what the the true ethos and soul of a brand is. There's got to Typically, most brands, even invented today or invented 150 years ago, they had that ethos as part of their DNA. So a lot of that is then at the social purpose level, making sure that we use some of the you know, really mighty powers of business to bring that on the world. But then I think you know, in a resource-constrained environment, which we are living in now, and then I don't talk about financial resource constraint, but actually, you know, environmentally resource constrained environments as well. I think it's also we've got to take upon ourselves to making sure that the products we deliver to consumers, and this is a vision. I know there's still a gap for most businesses to go through until we can deliver it, but we need to take it upon ourselves to when consumers get this product in their hands and when they buy it, it's, it's genuinely doesn't have any negative harm on the sort of environment in the world. Now, Negative harm, it should probably, you know, we should stretch our, our missions over time to even create a, a positive impact end to end, you know, from manufacturing all the way through to consumers. But I appreciate that there is a, there's a path we need to take there. So if, you know, my shiny new objects and probably my, my wish or mantra to everybody working on, on brands and within business is whatever part of that value chain that you deliver to the end consumers um, or, or the users of the experience that you map out clearly already today, what are the things we can do directly that directly will make the world better? And then over time, what's the roadmap to make sure that what you deliver is, is a baked in part of, 
I'm sorry, this sounds very conceptual, right? But it's a, it's it's essentially what you end up delivering end to end is is fully a, a good for people or the world or ideally both, uh, so that you know we we change this kind of mindless consumption pattern into a much more mindful consumption pattern. And some consumers will be very, or some users will be very kind of conscious about their consumptions, others won't be. And that's why I think as kind of leaders in businesses, we're gonna do the heavy lifting that whether consumers care about it or not, ultimately we need to take responsibility to drive that um, uh, commitment end to end. So that's, uh, it's a very long way to describe what I think business as a force for good means, but it's not trying to decouple your business model and what you do from doing good. It's an integral part of it. And the minute you do corporate social responsibility on the side, not worrying about your end-to-end -end value chain, that's where I think we, you know, we've got to take a firm stand against that. Now, not to be too, you know, rah -rah about uh, corporate social responsibility, but it's obviously something that, yeah, I, I think that is the easy way out. And we, we got to take the more complex way in and delivering it through, through the businesses that we run. Yeah. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. But the audience will want to know how you're doing that now. Are you able to talk about that? Uh, I'm, I'm able to talk about it in, in parts without, because obviously now we get into my, my day job. So I think specifically on, on a brand like Toblerone, when I, when I look about the origin of our founder spirit, which I think the brand had lost somewhere along the way, but Mr. Tobler, who invented Toblerone, he was actually a feminist. And this is the turn of the century in Switzerland, which is a very, very, very conservative culture, even until this date. I think they gave women voting rights in 1971. So we call him the kind of original triangle because he wanted genuinely to, to make a difference in the world. So he was a feminist. He fought for state paid maternity leave for women, uh, but he also believed in a world without borders. So he could have created another milk chocolate that was square, but instead he made a triangle and injected texture and he kind of created this fusion from Italy and Switzerland, which, you know, obviously are neighboring countries, but he brought in the Italian Tironi into making the best of Switzerland with the best of Italy in, in one kind of triangle bar. So we call them the original triangle. And of course, as, as a triangle in typically a world of squares, if you look at that met metaphorically, I think the very direct thing we want to take a stand for is, is celebrating, you know, differences and edges in the world. And in doing so, we also got to take a very active stance against things that kind of wants to shave off our edges in the world, which is, if you look at the growth of, of social, for example, uh, the, the growth of kind of bullying and cyberbullying has kind of exponentially grown in line with these, the growth of these platforms. We've all seen the social dilemma. So I think where my head is going specifically on Tomorrow, and, you know, um, is, is very directly now we need to think about how can we play a, a social role that helps people that are triangle in the world, which I think is a very aspirational thing to be, uh, because it means we, we take a stand for, you know, just throwing our edges out there. I mean, in the end, our belief is that the edges is what defines us. We are 99.9% .9 the same, but then we have our edges and we're going to celebrate those to make sure that those are the driving forces of impact in the world. So I think taking that a stance against something like uh, things that shapes off our edges, if that's bullying or, you know, other things, I think that's a, a very direct thing we want to try and tackle the top around. But then not settle with that social mission, if you like. I also think we got to start mapping out what is our end-to-end -end carbon footprint on the brand? What's our kind of way we are sourcing our, our beans, et cetera? And there, obviously, Mondelez have this incredible Copa Life program that we quickly want to get into top around because that's our way to really worry about the end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain of, of Toblerone. So again, without kind of making firm commitments on that, but the very fact that I'm on the brand means that I really want to think through the the end-to-end -end impact of delivering the experience, but then making sure socially in the world, we also want to take a very bold stand that really, you know, protect what our ultimate foundry spirit was about and, and you know, reimagining that in today's world. Uh, and then so always, yeah, sorry. No, no, carry on. No, and then I, I think, so that's applying it on a really big brand like Toblerone, the, the thinking of the little things that helps us do the big things. So, 
start with what we can do straight away today, but then making sure the roadmap is clear to, to get to an end-to-end -end sort of state there. Uh, when I look at my previous role, where we started something from scratch, then, you know, how did I do that on that was really to be quite relentless about a, an entirely circular business model. And when I say entirely circular, you know, don't, don't sort of uh, question or ask me if, you know, the transportation cost was fully wind powered, et cetera, because it wasn't. But I think the principle of upcycling an ingredient that otherwise would go to waste and we have used lots of water and resources to, to get it there. You can't waste anything in the supply chain. And then finding a way to manufacture that in a, in a wind powered sort of carbon neutral way, and then ultimately pack it in something that has a secondary value, i.e. recyclable, it's reusable, it's not made to be trashed. But then knowing that it doesn't matter if it's recyclable if people don't recycle. So creating that reward mechanism towards a help people wanting to recycle the, the product, I think was a very, yeah, I mean, it's something I'm quite proud of without sort of beating my own drum. Or, yeah, you know what I'm trying to say there. So um, I think for me, that, that was a very good sort of small scale application of the end to end, uh, that's not only thinking, but then practicality, how do we realize that to the consumers, but then taking on that challenge on a much bigger brand, I think, uh, you know, the blueprint and the confidence that it can be done came from the small in, in, in my previous role. And then trying to do that now in the bigger role is the, is the challenge. And when I say bigger role, I mean, it's the same. It's not smaller or bigger role, but obviously on a bigger brand that has its, you know, already established uh, kind of conventions. It's a, it's a little bit of a challenge. So, Emmanuel, we're going to have to leave that there, I'm afraid. If someone wants to get in touch with you, how would you like them to do that? Uh, well, I mean, I'm on the normal suspect socials, but LinkedIn is probably the thing I'm, I'm checking uh, more regularly. I, I've stopped using Facebook. I'm not very active on Instagram, so LinkedIn is the safest thing, and I think it's just my name, and then you'll find me there. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Tom. Anytime. Hi. Just before you go... I'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to write a review of the Shiny New Object podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, whatever it's called these days, or whichever podcast provider you use. We're an indie podcast, so it would go a long way for us if you could just share the word and give us a bit of a support on those channels. That would just be fantastic. If you haven't got time, that's also cool. And yeah, if you could tell your colleagues about the podcast and also, if possible, don't forget to subscribe. And I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, if you'd like to speak on the podcast or be a guest or you think I'm asking the wrong questions, anything, I'd be super interested to hear what you think. So please email me at tom at automatedcreative.net. That's T-O-M at, uh, I'm not going to bother spelling it. Anyway, you'll work it out. Thanks so much.